Hello, my name is not David Stuckey. I'm Sean Mills. Our dear brother David, as you, most of you know, had a, a horrible battle with kidney stones this week and hospitalized, and he's recovering. But uh, he had a procedure done to take care of that, and we're thankful that he was able to have that and pull through and be in recovery. Not able to be with us this morning, but just in case he is able to be online watching and participating in that way, let's give him a greeting. Hello, Pastor. <laughs> Our prayers are with you, brother. Let's commit this time to the Lord. Our dear Heavenly Father, our prayer this morning is that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you, O oh God, our rock and our salvation. Amen. As I thought about what to, what to share this morning in these very strange times that we live in, my heart went to the topic of humility. I felt that it's a core thing, an absolute thing that I've longed for and seen missing as I've looked around in the chaos that is called this world that we live in today. Um, whether it's looking at our political scene or the community trying to grapple with COVID. Uh, it's just been a recurring theme for me. In the days of conflict, humility is what we need. It's a core fundamental need. It's op the opposite of what comes naturally, that's for sure. Anybody have humility come naturally? Can I see a raising of hands? It's not natural. It goes against the grain of our nature, doesn't it? And yet, the tensions of our day bring to the forefront how woefully lacking humility is. You look at the varying approaches to COVID in our national scene, in our community here. You look in our society over the issues raised by the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement and the LGBTQ movements. They're pushing for something very strongly for society to wake up and, and take heed and come to their way of thinking. And then the battle against those movements, the reaction to those movements. In our politics, I think our politics has turned more polarized and rancorous than ever before in my lifetime. I, I cannot remember a time watching politics when it was more rancorous and divided. How about in your families? In our families where we deeply hurt each other and we just muddle through with broken relationships. And I got to tell you, being in lockdown together for extended periods compounds the potential for conflict in our homes, amen? Being on top of each other a long time. It can get rough. It's a real challenge. The core need we need in all of these conflicts is humility. Now, I, before your mind goes to the thinking that maybe we're going down the path of psychological babble instead of scriptural truth today, uh, let me correct that notion. No, it's, the topic of humility is not something that you go to scripture and overtly find everywhere. I'm sorry, I missed my slide. It is not a neat neatly packaged overt theme in scripture, but I will suggest that it's a meaty topic of biblical teaching. You'll find that if you go to the concordance and look up the word humility, 
you'll find a handful of verses, a smattering throughout the whole Bible. That's not the way you search this topic. <laughs> it's a concept. It's not a people, place, or a thing that's easily found in a concordance. But I assure you, it's in the background everywhere in Scripture. It is big, with a capital B, capital I, capital G. If you think about it, pride is a root element behind all forms of evil that you find in the world today. And I think you find that smattered throughout Scripture, that teaching. Look at Satan's rebellion in the, before we were around. What happened to Satan? He wanted to be like God, right? He wanted to, being an archangel wasn't enough, right? Pride drove Satan to want more, to want to position himself as God. Look at the temptation of Eve, right? When humans arrive on the scene, what's her temptation? Satan says, you can be like God. Eve, knowing good from evil. You don't have to be mere mortal anymore. A human being, you can want more. How about our temptation in our life? James 1 puts it this way, the process of sin in our life and destruction that it reigns. James says, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. You look at the death around you, and James says, behind that death is the actions of sin, right? The behavioral sin that caused it. And you look behind the behavioral sin, and what do you find? A continual lust for more. We crave, we want the desires of our heart met, right? We are drawn away of our own lust and enticed. Now, don't think sexual immorality here when you see, hear the word lust. It's just generally the, the lust of our eyes, the pride of life, right? The, the things that we desire for self. We go after and we don't like anybody standing in the way. We fight for what we want. Pride is the foundational element behind all forms of evil that you can think of. Every sin has pride as a root. Then wouldn't it be right to expect that the opposite of pride would be behind all forms of righteousness? What's the opposite of pride? Humility. I submit to you that humility, that sparsely found word in your concordance, is really behind all forms of righteousness. In fact, I'm sorry, I'm doing a very poor job of seeing my cues for slides here. <clears throat> in fact, humility is behind every key theme of godly living that you can find in Scripture, I would submit. Once you see humility in this light, you'll start seeing humility everywhere in Scripture. Take a look at the theme of worship. Is that a big theme in Scripture? Turn to Malachi chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. He says, Malachi, God is speaking here. He says to his people, a son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, oh, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, oh, how have we polluted you? by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. 
when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is not that evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? God's people think that they have a relationship with God. He says at the opening here, you call me father, that's what I hear from your lips. You call me master, I hear you referring me to me that way. But then they're taken aback. They're a bit scratching their heads. God, what are you talking about? We have a problem here. <laughs> they're surprised at his questioning because they're going through the motions of worship. They're doing the right things. They're doing the sacrificial system that he laid out, sort of. <laughs> Why is God upset with their worship? Because all he's getting is leftovers, right? What does that say or reveal about their hearts? What it says is that self matters more than God. Whew. God's saying to them, you say that you're worshiping me with these sacrifices that you're bringing to me, but if all I'm getting is leftovers, what it means is you're keeping the best for yourself. Amen? Isn't that our problem? The attitude of our hearts tends towards, I'll keep the best of my time, treasure, and talents for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> and the rest you can have, God. What's, you know, we'll get you, we'll get you something. True worship that pleases God and is good for me involves the sacrifice of self for the glory of God. Think about what he calls us to in worship. How about Sabbath keeping? Right? That's a form of worship, isn't it? God says to us, because he knows us well, set aside for me one day. Right? This one day out of your seven, set aside for the most important relationship of your life. The God who made you knows and loves you so much, He wants to renew relationship with you once a week. <laughs> Isn't that a good thing? Should be. We should be reveling for that breather once a week, that reconnection time when everything else is set aside, the normal stuff of life, the labor, the intense stress. And I can recharge with my God. Shouldn't that be wonderful? But what do we tend to give him instead? We tend toward leftovers. We so easily get sucked into the normal stuff of life, right? And give him a little bit, sort of, Sabbath, right? You with me? How about tithing, another form of worship he lays out in the Old Testament, right? And confirms in the New Testament is a good idea. <laughs> what do we tend to give him? Well, uh, I have a lot of bills, God. <laughs> There's a lot on my uh, priority list right now that I need to spend money on, things that I need, uh, things I've been waiting on a long time. My dreams need to be fulfilled, you know. What does God call us to give? He says, give me your first fruits. Isn't that the biblical call? My people, give me your first fruits of your labor. And see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out to you more than your, your storehouses can hold. But give me your first fruits, not your leftovers. Isn't that the theme of worship? Humble myself. <laughs> Don't pursue what myself needs and wants. But submit, sub, subvert my selfish needs for the glory of God. Amen? You see humility there? Behind worship. In true worship, he's all of that, not me. 
Okay. How about love for others? Major key theme in Scripture, right? Love for others. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. This is a section where Paul's describing what relationships in the new life should look like. Okay, you come to Christ, you have a new life in Him. How do you relate to people? Especially those that mean the most to you. Let's read. Paul says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. As it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Has that been the form of your speech lately in your confined house with everybody on top of each other in hibernation? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for that day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That's quite a list, isn't it? Now, there's no mention of humility in that passage, is there? <laughs> but do you see the phrase, give grace to those who hear? Is your purpose behind all this interaction to give grace to those who hear, hearing your speech? I don't know about you, but my natural tendency is to give them what they deserve. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, what they deserve is usually my silence, my anger in return for their anger, uh, my taking them down a peg if they're too proud, a little full of themselves. Is that what they deserve usually, the people around you? And the list could go on and on, right? Our tendency is to give them what they deserve, not give grace to those who hear. All the pride-induced interaction, he gives a long list of that, right? The pride-induced interactions are the bitterness and the wrath and the anger, clamor, slander. What's he say to do with all that junk? Put it away from you, right? Let it go, let it go. Don't bother me anymore. Yes, yeah, that, that stuff. Let it go, he says. All the humility-induced stuff in this list, what's he say to do with that? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. He says, be full of that. Put away from you all the self-induced, pride-induced interactions that you have in your new life and be full of these humility-induced interactions. And at the end he says, remember, that's how God handles you. <laughs> Forgive one another as Christ, as God in Christ forgave you. Right? That takes humility to forgive the other and to give them grace in their time of need. My approach to others will not be marked by love as long as I believe I have my act together more than they do. Right? When I start having a humble view of myself in relation to others, then my interaction starts to be marked by kindness, tenderheartedness, forgiveness, giving grace. How about this big theme in Scripture? Prayer. Listen to the psalmist pray here in Psalm 73. God, you guide me with your counsel. Afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth <laughs> that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It only makes sense to turn to God like this in prayer if I recognize how amazingly inadequate I am. 
when I have a felt need of direction and comfort, do you hear that in his voice here? He needs, he has a deep felt need because of who he is in relation to the God of heaven and earth. He has a need for God's direction. Guide me, God. Comfort me, God. He knows who he is in relation to this great God. You see, if I'm sufficient, I don't need prayer. It's only when I'm full of humility that I am driven to prayer. <laughs> Amen? So humility is nowhere to be found here in the words, but it's everywhere to be found here in our prayer life. Therefore, humility, I submit to you, is the foundational concept in God's mind. It's foundational. It's kind of like Portland in cement. Now, those of you who aren't in construction, like I wasn't until senior year in high school, I, didn't even, I couldn't have told you what Portland was, if you asked me, until I had to start carrying these things. <laughs> Try to carry one of those around on your shoulder for a while. Upstairs, onto a... Yeah. That made me the bulky he-man that I am today. <clears throat> you can tell that that was 30 years ago, can't you? I used to haul those things around. Um, Portland, when, if you saw a pile of it out in the quarry, you wouldn't know what it was. It wouldn't make sense that it was very important stuff. It looks like dust. But I tell you, you can mix water, gravel, and sand together all you want. <laughs> and you ain't going to get nothing but slop. You add this stuff to that mixture, and you got something amazing turn out a day later. Hard as rock. Something you can build a foundation on. It's seemingly innocuous stuff, but it's the glue that binds everything together. Think of Portland, uh, humility like Portland. You've seen that humility is critical, right? We know that it's important, but how does it affect every aspect? Of, uh, no, I'm sorry. How, does, how do I cultivate it if it's this important, right? That's what we need to take a look at here. How do I cultivate humility? I submit to you that the answer is in two parts. One, God has to enable me to understand two things. They seem basic, but we got to get a hold of these. The world doesn't get a hold of these, and we naturally don't get a hold of these. One, I must fully understand my true human condition. Jeremiah puts it this way, The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. King James says wicked. The ESV says desperately sick. Who can understand it? This is just one little nutshell verse. You'll see this throughout Scripture, that God defines my heart, the condition of our human state, as one of being full of wicked tendencies. We have a rebellious spirit in us. We don't submit easily to God, right? Humility is not our norm. We have sick hearts. Now, is that what you hear from the culture around you? <laughs> Nothing like that. We read a statement like this. It, it sounds shocking to hear scripture in our culture today. When you read Romans 3 and it says, um, there's no one who follows after God, no one who seeks God. You know, we've all turned away. And, uh, no one do, does good. No, not one. That, that's like weirdness to our world. What we hear from our world is you're good, you're strong, right? It's just the opposite. The mantra of our day is believe in yourself. You're strong, capable, amazing. You're amazing. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. And you must project that belief. Well, 
yes, God made me amazing at creation, <laughs> but I'm a fallen being with a deceitful heart, God says. And until I embrace that, I'm going to have trouble with humility, right? Think about how often our politicians today project the attitude of <laughs> believe in yourself, you're strong, capable, amazing, and you have to project that belief. Listen to how Paul describes our condition. For we know in part, Paul says at the end of the love chapter, big, another big theme in scripture, right? Love. Listen to how he closes this chapter on love. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but the times are coming when perfection comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then a time's a coming when we'll be face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now, right here and now, in the present, we're clouded in our understanding. Like kids, we know in part, we got this partial understanding. We're looking through a foggy glass, right? When perfection comes, we'll know the whole picture. <laughs> this imperfect, partial understanding will disappear. But that's not now. Now we've got this great mystery. We have childlike reasoning, Paul says. So, here's the test. In your next family argument, it's a coming real soon. It might be in the car on your way home. In your next family argument, will you, A, believe that the person you're arguing with, their reasoning is faulty and your reasoning is right? Are you going to believe that as your default? Are you going to believe that your memory is perfect and their memory is suspect because that's not what you said? Are you going to assume their motive is bad and yours are pure? Not if you have Paul's understanding of your heart and your condition right now. Not if you believe what Jeremiah just said. I don't know about you, but when I'm in conflict, my mind doesn't go there. <laughs> my mind goes into how I'm right, and my reasoning's better than theirs. My argument's right, theirs is wrong, they're faulty. Anybody with me on that? That's my natural state. God calls us to something very different. How about the next political discussion you have? <laughs> Will you, <laughs> A, believe they're out to lunch, you have this issue rightly figured out, or, because you believe this, are you going to believe your experience is limited, and therefore you might actually learn something from listening to their experience? Mm. That's a tough one, isn't it? Okay, so just in review, where does humility come from? A, the first answer is God giving me an understanding of my true human condition, right? I am fallen, I am faulty, I am limited. Do you believe that about yourself? <laughs> That'll help you be humble. Second answer to that question is by God enabling us to understand the divine condition. Now, we all think we understand that. But take a look. Listen to Paul describe it here. It's an amazing description in, near the end of Romans. Paul says, oh, looking at God, the depth of the riches and wisdom of knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Paul says, when I take a look at the God of heaven and earth, I, I can't even come close to getting there. <laughs> right? Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? 
Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? He's so other than me. He is so high and lifted up. His thoughts are not my thoughts, as high as the heavens are above the earth, right? You get this amazing, lifted up vision of who God is. Paul says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. When you get a hold of the view of God that Paul describes here, and your heart gets a hold of that, you just go, wow. <laughs> How small am I? How great is God? Don read the passage in Isaiah that describes God amazingly in this way. And you see that throughout Scripture, passages like that. The passage in Isaiah, he says, Don't you know who this is? <laughs> My people, don't you know who you're talking to here? You remember God talking that way to Pharaoh in Egypt when he wouldn't let his people go? Remember him talking to Job that way? When Job had lost sight of who God was? And Job's friends really had too? You hear him, God talking to the prophets, through the prophets, to his people that way? No one of us can begin to fathom the greatness of the God of the universe. He's amazing. I close with this parable. Sorry. There once was a tulip bulb. And it sprouted this cute little tulip. And it was beautiful. And every year, year after year, it came up. And Solomon would say it had a glory of God in how, how it was dressed. And one year, a sequoia tree, a seed dropped near it and grew up. And year after year after year after thousands of years, it became bigger and bigger and bigger. And it didn't look like that tulip. It wasn't pretty, as pretty as the tulip, but man, did it grow, outgrow that tulip. And it became pretty happy with its towering nature how its stature far outstripped the stature of that little tulip. And he used to, he subconsciously, he never said it out loud to the tulip, of course, that he was much bigger than the tulip, <laughs> much closer to God than that tulip, the God who had made him and that tulip. But he was subtly proud that his arms stretched out and made a canopy that spread out over this tulip and was so much closer to God. When you think about this sequoia and the tulip, the attitude of the sequoia is one of pride, of course. And, but it, it would seem, if you're the sequoia, that you'd understand where he's coming from. I mean, he towers over this tulip, so much bigger than that tulip. Now just imagine that you were the sun instead of the sequoia tree or the tulip. You're looking at this from the sun's perspective. And the sun overhears this sequoia tree's thoughts of cock-a-doodle-doing about its stature and how much bigger it is than the tulip, how much closer to the sun it is. Can you imagine how much the sun would be laughing its head off? <laughs> okay, sequoia tree, so you're 375,234,213 miles away from me. And that tulip's 375,234,213.03 miles away from me. Whoop-de-doo! 
your two little squirts. Right? We so easily get to thinking that we're a sequoia versus the tulips around us. From God's perspective, we're little squirts. <laughs> if God enabled me to understand both my human condition and his divine condition, then I promise you two things in closing. One, there would be a growing spirit of humility with that growing spirit, growing that spirit of humility would be an imperative for me. It's a must. I've got to do it. I've got to work on that. And two, I'll enjoy a growing sense of relational intimacy, both with God and with you, with others, those around me. If humility is the hallmark of my life. Let's pray. God, take us there, we pray. Every one of us so needs this as the core of our life. In these times of conflict, conflict is just raging out of control so many ways around us. I pray that you take us to this spirit of humility you so desire, you so strongly call us to in Scripture. Work on us to see with new eyes how to grow this in our hearts. In Christ we pray. Amen.